I have had Huntington's disease since I was 30. Yeah, a long time. Got the call from my birth father and birth mother letting me know that Neil had it. And then when I looked it up, I found out that there was a 50% chance that I could have it. So then I chose to get the blood test. I called the neurologist and set up an appointment. And I um, ended up having the blood test to determine if I was gonna have it or not. We educated ourselves okay. and really dug into the disease because we had no idea what it was about. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, living in Seattle, we had lots of friends that were willing to help us. We weren't as tech savvy as most of our friends were, but they were. And uh, we did a lot of educating Research. of ourselves mm -hmm. to understand what the disease was all about. I was only really willing to tell friends, really good friends and family. But then once I decided to tell people, then I went out and decided to have a coming out party. I had a coming out party and made a joke that I wish I was gay, but I need to tell you all that I have Huntington's disease. Because I didn't want anybody to judge me. I didn't want people to not want to be my friend, but then I realized that wasn't the case at all. And people were very kind. They were very kind. I got very lucky. So I always knew I wanted to do something like a big fundraiser to raise money because there was no money. But then I didn't have the, I didn't want to come out and tell everybody either. I don't want people to not be friends with me. You lose your mind and your body with HD. I, mean, I think a lot of things, you just lose one or the other. Mm. And because there's no cure. I think that's the other thing that's shocking. Because it's year 2017 and there's no cure. It's kind of shocking. This is a genetic disorder that shouldn't go to the next generation. Our foundation has been in place, this is the fourth mm -hmm. year. Right. And we have a three-pronged mission. We want to educate people mm -hmm. about the disease. Right. We want to fund research to uh, uh, mm -hmm. find a treatment or a cure. Mm -hmm. And then the final point that we tell everyone is you got to believe. You got to believe. We believe every single day. Mm -hmm. This thing is a, mm -hmm. it's a curable disease. Right. We're absolutely convinced mm -hmm. this thing will be done in our lifetime. Right. It's the best thing that we've ever done is to start our own foundation yes. because every single single dollar that we raise is not only accounted for, but just mm -hmm. about every single dollar that we raise goes mm -hmm. to research. I'm impressed with the GM project and I'm glad we're giving our donation to it this year. The GM1 project has been a passion of ours for over 25 years. We have some very unique animals. So we, we, we believe these lambs were created by God just for this purpose. They have a specific genetic mutation of their own. Uh, they accumulate 40 times normal levels of GM1 gangliocide. It makes each one of these lambs its own mini wool-covered bioreactor. Uh, the model we work with is that one lamb could treat a patient for one year, and it's, it's a renewable resource. The challenges we've had and, and why the support of Bev's foundation is so critical is that pharmaceutical companies aren't really excited about natural molecules and they don't particularly want raw materials that are covered in wool. Uh, the challenge is this molecule cannot be synthesized, so there is no alternative. You're talking a safe compound. We have the means to produce it. And, and there's a waiting list of sheep producers that want to do this. Um, I get calls all the time and I say, I'll put you on a waiting list because it's hard not to get the sheep production ahead of the science. So once we can do the rapid expansion and have the GM1 purified and ready to go as a drug, then we can incorporate all the sheep we can get. This project has incredible potential and it just, it just needs to get to the patients. Well, I think GM1 ganglicides has a great deal of promise for uh, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, especially Huntington's disease, but also Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and maybe even traumatic brain injury or stroke. It's an exciting time uh, to look at GM1 ganglicides again. The, the ovine source may be uh, a lifesaver in terms of uh, having a, a, um, a less expensive source and I think the, the idea of, you know, introducing Tay-Sachs or gangliosidosis in sheep and providing uh, an enormous uh, amount of GM1 per lamb 
um, is, is uh, I think, very, very uh, innovative. And um, so this is a, an exciting new source uh, for GM1 ganglicides, and it, it may be something that, that could be clinically useful uh, in the near future. As an experimentalist, you, that's why we do uh, studies because we don't know for sure, but you certainly want to spend your time and effort uh, uh, where your best bets are. And I think right now this is a very, very good bet. The nice thing about GM1 ganglicides, and, and again, this is from bovine source, uh, but if ovine uh, shows this uh, similar pattern, uh, it's perfectly safe for individuals to take. It's, it's gone through that step in, in, in phase one of, uh, thanks to Jay Snyder's work primarily, but uh, it's gone through that, that first stage of safety profiling. And uh, fortunately, we know it, it's safe uh, and it can be effective even in humans. And so I think there's a lot of upside to uh, the use of GM1 ganglicide beyond uh, Huntington's disease beyond uh, some of the neurodegenerative diseases. So I think, um, I think the use of ovine GM1 source uh, may be a godsend for, for lots of people.